Hello everyone! I hope you're ready for another adventure, because today Wayne continues to read Harry Potter in the Sorcerer's Stone. Yay! Always remember that as we go through these amazing adventures and read these stories, all you have to do is press the CC button in your YouTube link to be able to follow along with the words. Now I believe that Madame Owl will be perfect to join us for today's adventure. Now that she's here, let's jump in. Hooray! Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone Nicholas Flamel Dumbledore had convinced Harry not to go looking for the mirror wreath again, and for the rest of the Christmas holidays, the invisibility cloak stayed folded at the bottom of his trunk. Harry wished he could forget what he'd seen in the mirror as easily, but he couldn't. He started having nightmares. Over and over again, he dreamed about his parents disappearing in a flash of green light, while a high voice cackled with laughter. You see, Dumbledore was right. That mirror could drive you mad, said Ron, when Harry told him about these dreams. Hermione, who had come back before term started, took a different view of things. She was torn between horror at the idea of Harry being out of bed, roaming the school three nights in a row, if Filch had caught you and disappointment that he hadn't at least found who Nicholas Flamel was. They had almost given up hope of ever finding Flamel in a library book, even though Harry was still sure he'd read the name somewhere. Once term had started, they were back to skimming through books for 10 minutes during their break. Harry had even less time than the other two, because Quidditch practice had started again. Wood was working the team harder than ever. Even the endless rain that had replaced the snow couldn't dampen his spirits. The Weasleys complained that Wood was becoming a fanatic, but Harry was on Wood's side. If they had won their next match against Hufflepuff, they would overtake Slytherin in the house championship for the first time in seven years. Quite apart from wanting to win, Harry found that he had fewer nightmares when he was tired after training. Then, during one particularly wet and muddy practice session, Wood gave the team a bit of bad news. He'd just gotten very angry with the Weasleys who'd kept dive-bombing each other and pretending to fall off their brooms. Will you stop messing around, he yelled. That's exactly the sort of thing that'll lose us the match. Snape's refereeing this time, and he'll be looking for any excuse to knock points off of Gryffindor. George Weasley was really about to fall off his broom at these words. Snape's refereeing. He sputtered with a mouthful of mud. When's he ever refereed a Quidditch match? He's not going to be fair if we overtake Slytherin. The rest of the team landed next to George to complain to. It's not my fault, said Wood. We've just got to make sure we play a clean game so Snape hasn't got an excuse to pick on us. Which was all very well, thought Harry, but he had another reason for not wanting Snape near him while he played Quidditch. The rest of the team hung back to talk to one another as usual at the end of practice, but Harry headed straight back to Gryffindor Common Room, where he found Ron and Hermione playing chess. Chess was the only thing Hermione ever lost at, something Ron and Harry thought was very good for her. Don't talk to me at the moment, said Ron when Harry sat down. I need to consen... He caught sight of Harry's face. What's the matter with you? You look terrible. Speaking quietly so that no one can hear, Harry told the others about Snape's sudden sinister desire to be a Quidditch referee. Don't play, said Hermione at once. Say you're real, said Ron. Pretend to break your leg, Hermione suggested. Really break your leg, said Ron. I can't, said Harry. There isn't a reserve seeker. If I backed out, Gryffindor can't play at all. At that moment, Neville toppled into the common room. How he managed to climb through the portrait hole was anyone's guess, because his legs had been stuck together with what they recognized at once was a lug locker curse. He must have gotten to a bunny hop all the way to Gryffindor Tower. Everyone fell over laughing except Hermione, who leapt up and performed a counter -curve. Never's legs spread apart and he got up to his feet trembling. What's happened? Hermione asked him, leading him over to sit with Ron and Harry. Malfoy, said Neville shakily. I met him outside the library. He said he'd been looking for someone to practice that on. Go to Professor McGonagall, Hermione urged Neville. Report him. Neville shook his head. I don't want more trouble, he mumbled. You've got to stand up to him, Neville, said Ron. He's used to walking over people, but that's no reason to lie down in front of him and make it easier. There's no need to tell me I'm not brave enough to be in Gryffindor. Malfoy's already done that, Neville choked out. Harry felt in his pocket of robes and pulled out a chocolate frog, the very last one from the box Hermione had given him for Christmas. He gave it to Neville, who looked as though he might cry. You're worth twelve of Malfoy, Harry said. The sorting hat chose you for Gryffindor, didn't it? And where's Malfoy? And stinking Slytherin. 
Neville's lips twitched in a weak smile as he wrapped the frog. Thanks, Harry. I think I'll go to bed. Do you want a card for your collection, don't you? As Neville walked away, Harry looked at the famous wizarding card. Dumbledore again. He was the first card I ever... <gasps> he gasped. He stared at the back of the card and then he looked up at Ron and Harry. I found him, he whispered. I found Flamel. I told you I'd read the name somewhere before. I read it on the train coming here. Listen to this. Dumbledore is particularly famous for his defeat of the dark wizard Grindelwald in 1945 for the discovery of 12 uses for dragon's blood and his work on alchemy with partner Nicholas Flamel. Hermione jumped out of her seat. She hadn't looked so excited since she'd gotten back the marks from her first piece of homework. Stay there, she uh, said, and sprinted up the stairs to the girls' dormitories. Harry and Ron barely had time to exchange mystified looks before she came dashing back with an enormous old book in her arms. I never thought to look here, she whispered excitedly. I got this out of the library weeks ago for a bit of light reading. Light? said Ron. But Hermione told him to be quiet until she looked something up and started flicking frantically through the pages, muttering to herself. At last, she found what she was looking for. I knew it, I knew it. Are we allowed to speak yet? said Ron, grumbling. Hermione ignored him. Nicholas Femel, she whispered dramatically, is the only known maker of the Sorcerer's Stone. This didn't quite have the effect she expected. The what? said Harry and Ron. Oh, honestly, don't you two read. Look, read that. There, she pushed the book toward them. Ron and Harry read. The ancient study of alchemy is concerned with making the Sorcerer's Stone a legendary substance with astonishing power. The stone will transform any metal into pure gold. It also produces the elixir of life, which will make the drinker immortal. There have been many reports of the Sorcerer's Stone over the centuries, but the only stone currently in existence belongs to Mr. Nicholas Flamel, the noted alchemist and opera lover. Mr. Flamel, who celebrated his 665th birthday last year, enjoys a quiet life in Devon with his wife, Purnell. 658. See, said Hermione. When Harry and Ron had finished, the dog must be guarding Flamel's Sorcerer's Stone. I best he asked Dumbledore to keep it safe for him because they're friends and knew someone was after it. That's why he wanted the stone moved from Gringotts. A stone that makes gold and stops you from ever dying, says Harry. No wonder Stapes after it. Anyone would want it. And no wonder he couldn't find Flamel in that study of recent developments in Wizard recent, Ron. It's not exactly recent if he's 665, is he? The next morning in defense against the dark's arts, while copying down different ways of treating werewolf bites, Harry and Ron were still discussing what they'd do with the Sorcerer's Stone if they had one. It wasn't until Ron said he'd buy his own Quidditch team that Harry remembered about Snake coming to the match. I'm going to play, he told Ron and Hermione. If I don't, all the Slytherins will think I'm too scared to face Snape. I'll show them. It'll really wipe the smile off their faces if we win. Just as long as we're not wiping you off the field, Hermione said. As the match drew near, however, Harry became more and more nervous. Whatever he told Ron and Hermione, the rest of the team wasn't too calm, either. The idea of overtaking Slytherin in the house championship was wonderful. No one had done it for seven years, but would they be allowed to with such a biased referee? Harry didn't know whether he was imagining it or not, but he seemed to keep running into Snape wherever he went. At times, he even wondered whether Snape was following him, trying to catch him on his own. Potion's lessons were turning into a sort of weekly torture. Snape was so horrible to Harry. Could Snape possibly know they'd found out about the Sorcerer's Stone? Harry didn't know how he could, yet sometimes he had the horrible feeling that Snape could read minds. Harry knew when they'd wished him good luck outside the locker rooms the next afternoon that Ron and Hermione were wondering where they'd ever see him alive ever again. This wasn't what you'd call comforting. Harry hardly heard a word of Wood's pep talk as he pulled his Quidditch robes and picked up his Nimbus 2000. Ron and Hermione, however, had found a place in the stands next to Neville, who couldn't understand why they looked so grim and worried, or why they had both brought their wands to the match. Little did Harry know that Ron and Hermione had been secretly practicing the leg lock curse. They'd gotten the idea from Malfoy using it on Neville and were ready to use it on Snape if he showed any sign in wanting to hurt Harry. Now don't forget, it's locomotor mortis, Hermione muttered to Ron slipped his wand under his sleeve. I know, he snapped. Don't nag. Back in the locker room, Wood had taken Harry aside. Don't want to press you, Potter. But if we ever need an early capture of the snitches now, finish the game before Snape can favor Hufflepuff too much. 
The whole school's out there, said Fred Weasley, peering out the door. Even blimey Dumbledore's come to watch. Harry's heart did a somersault. Dumbledore, he said, dashing to the door to make sure. Fred was right. There was no mistaking that silver beard. Harry could have laughed out with a sound of relief. He was safe. There was simply no way Snape would dare to try to hurt him if Dumbledore was watching. Perhaps that was why Snape was looking so angry as the teams marched onto the field. Something that Ron noticed, too. I've never seen Snape look so mean, he told Hermione. Look, they're off. Ouch. Someone poked Ron in the back. It was Malfoy. Oh, sorry, Weasley. Didn't see you there. Malfoy grinned broadly as Krabby and Goyle. Wonder how long Potter's going to stay on his room this time. Anyone want to bet? What about you, Weasley? Ron didn't answer. Snape had just awarded Hufflepuff a penalty because George Woody hit a bludger at him. Hermione, who had all her fingers crossed in her lap, was squinting fixedly at Harry, who was circling the game like a hawk looking for a snitch. You know how I know they think they choose people for Gryffindor team, said Malfoy, loudly a few minutes later, as Snape awarded Hufflepuff another penalty for no reason. It's people they feel sorry for. See, there's Potter, who's got no parents. Then there's the Weasleys, who've got no money. You should be on the team, Longbottom. You've got no brains. Neville went bright red and turned in his feast to fate Malfoy. I'm worth 12 of you, Malfoy, he stammered. Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle howled at laughter, but Ron, still not daring to take his eyes off the game, said, You tell him, Neville. Longbottom, if brains were gold, you're poorer than Weasley, and that's saying something. Ron's nerves were already stretched to the breaking point with anxiety about Harry. I'm warning you, Malfoy. One word. Ron, Hermione said suddenly. Harry, what, where? Harry had suddenly gone into a spectacular dive, which drew grasps and tears from the crowd. Hermione stood up, her fingers crossed in hope, as Harry streaked toward the ground like a butt. You're in luck, Weasley. Potter's obviously spotted some money on the ground, said Malfoy. Ron snapped. Before Malfoy knew what was happening, Ron was on top of him, wrestling to the ground. Neville hesitated, then clambered over the back seat to help. Come on, Harry, Hermione screamed, leaping onto her seat to watch as Harry sped straight at Snape. She didn't even notice Malfoy and Ron rolling under the seat or the scuffles and yelps coming from the whirl of fists that was Neville, Crab, and Goyle. Go Neville! Up in the air, Snape turned his broomstick just in time to see something scarlet shoot past him, missing him by inches. The next second, Harry had pulled out of a dive, raved an arm in triumph. The snitch clasped in his hands. The snams erupted. It had to be a record. No one had ever remembered the snitch being caught so quickly. Ron! Ron! Where are you? The game's over. Harry's won. We've won. Gryffindor's in the lead, shrieked Hermione, dancing up and down on her seat and hugging Parchivi Patil in the row in front. Harry jumped off his broom, a foot from the ground. He couldn't believe it. He'd done it. The game was over. It barely lasted five minutes. As Gryffindor's came spilling onto the field, he saw Snape land nearby, white-faced and tight-lipped. Then Harry felt a hand on his shoulder and looked up into Dumbledore's smiling face. Well done, said Dumbledore quietly so that only Harry could hear. Nice to see you've been brooding about that mirror, been keeping busy. Excellent. Snape spat bitterly at the ground. Harry left the locker room alone some time later to his Nimbus 2000 back to the broom shed. He couldn't ever remember feeling happier. He'd really done something to be proud of now. No one could say he was just famous for his name anymore. The evening air never smelled so sweet. He walked over the damp grass reliving the last hour in his head, which was a happy blur. Gryffindors running to lift them onto the shoulder, Ron and Hermione in the distance jumping on and down, Ron cheering through a heavy nosebleed. Harry had reached the shed. He leaned against the wooden door and looked up at Hogwarts. With its windows glowing red in the setting sun, Gryffindor in the lead. He'd done it. He'd shown Snape. And speaking of Snape, a hooded figure came swiftly down the steps of the castle, Clearly not wanting to be seen, it walked as fast as possible toward, toward the Forbidden Forest. Harry's victory faded from his mind as he watched. He recognized the figure's prowling walk, Snape, sneaking into the forest while everyone was at dinner. What was going on? Harry jumped back onto his Nimbus 2000 and took off. Gliding silently over the castle, he saw Snape into the forest at a run. He followed. The trees were so thick, he couldn't see where Snape had gone. He flew in circles, lowering and lowering brushing the top branches of the trees until he heard voices. He glided towards them and landed noiselessly in a towering birch tree. He climbed carefully along the branches, holding tightly to his broomstick, trying to see through the leaves. Below in a shading clearing stood Snape, but he wasn't alone. Quirrell was there too. 
Harry couldn't make out the look of his face, but he was stuttering worse than ever. Harry strained to catch what they were saying. D -d don't know why you wanted to, to meet here, of all p -p places, Snape. Severus. Oh, I thought we could keep this private, said Snape, his voice icy. Students aren't supposed to know about the Sorcerer's Stone, after all. Harry leaned forward. Quirrell was mumbling something. Snape interrupted. Have you found out how to get past that beast of Hagrid yet? But, 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 Severus, I, I... You don't want me as your enemy, Quirrell, said Snape, taking a step forward. I, I, I know what, what, what you... You know perfectly what I mean. An owl hooted loudly, and Harry Miller fell out of the tree. He'd steadied himself in time to hear Snape say, You're a little bit of hocus pocus. I'm waiting. But, but, I d -d 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 Very well, Snape said. We'll have another chat soon, when you've had time to think about things over and decide where your loyalties lie. He threw his cloak over his head and strode out of the clearing. It was almost dark now, but Harry could see Quirrell standing quite still as though he was petrified. Harry! Where have you been, Hermione squeaked. We won, we won, we won, shouted Ron, thumping Harry on the back. And I gave Malfoy a black eye, and Neville tried to take on Crabbe and Goyle, single-handedly. He's still out cold. But Madame Pomfrey says he'll be all right. Talk about showing Slytherin. Everyone's waiting for you in the common room. We're having a party. Fred and George stole some cakes and stuff from the kitchens. Never mind that now, said Harry breathlessly. Let's find an empty room. Wait till you hear this. He made sure Peeves wasn't inside before shutting the door behind them. Then he told them what he'd seen and heard. So we were right. It is the Sorcerer's Stone, and Snape's trying to force Quirrell to help him get it. He asked if he knew how to get past Fluffy, and he said something about Quirrell's hocus pocus. I reckon there are other things guarding the stone apart from Fluffy. Loads of enchantments, probably, in Quirrell would have done some anti-dark art spell that Snape needs to break through. So you mean the stone's the only safe as long as Quirrell stands up to Snape? Said Hermione in alarm. It'll be gone by next Tuesday, said Ron. I think that is a great place to end this chapter as we read Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. What did you think, Madame Owl? I like that part too. Hope to see you again soon. We hope to see you soon, here with Wayne Reads. Thank you for joining us, and we can't wait to see you on the next amazing adventure. Bye-bye!